the opportunities with the experience and skills that I had to be promoted and to go on to make better opportunities and careers for myself. I found myself being discouraged, depressed, and with nowhere to turn, I ended up back in New York City housing. It's a blessing and a curse in disguise. And I must say that I find a public housing to be a haven. And how ironic is that? So we must keep public housing public because we are the backbone of this society. We are the entry level workers. Some of us do move up. And because of the 30% income that they charge us, we are paying 30% of what our income is. I mean, I'm so frustrated and I speak for the people that I come in contact with every day as a leader in this community. We are afraid, we are frustrated, we are beside ourselves because every time you look around, there's something blocking our advances. And this has been happening for 400 years. Enough is enough. We are only reacting, if we are only reacting to what NYCHA offers us, residents, and we are only counting on help from the federal government via the Biden infrastructure package. This leaves us residents vulnerable to what the NYCHA and the federal government, uh, which as we know, has put us in a very situation we find ourselves in today. We do not need private developers to come in to change section nine to section eight, which will take away a lot of the opportunities for the residents to live and to uh, address their issues and to function and to have a quality of life. Our goal here is to create independent organizations, resident organizations who can turn out thousands into the streets and build resident councils where we manage with the help of independent professionals, manage our own developments using HUD resident management components and any other number of um, activities that we choose. How we work together and how we build coalitions will determine if we can create this power. And I know that we can. Reacting, waiting and asking for help from NYCHA, elected officials and government has failed us. Let's work independently together, build power. We can do this, we must do this. We must stand up and fight back. And I am here today to let you know that Janine, who lives already on the RAD side, has uh, commented about uh, no heat, hot water, worse conditions as in NYCHA before uh, she would prefer to be in NYCHA than to be under this RAD. When she goes to the management office and complains, they don't listen. Uh, I know so many people have been evicted. There are more people evicted in that one development of Ocean Bay than in all of New York City housing in the past three years. That is so nefarious and so evil. Where are we to go when we are already at ground zero, when we are the essential workers? How would this city run if we have no place to lay our heads, no place to help our families, address the issues that we have? Under NYCHA, public housing, we can do this. We can go to court, we have representation. Under the RAD plan and the new management, we don't have the same opportunities. They give them uh, refurbished appliances that they call brand new, and they're not. They put up uh, cabinets in the kitchens which are falling apart, and the residents are told that they must fix them on their own. The water is not good. There is no real security other than the uh, the cameras that they put up, and they have no recourse when it comes to the eviction process. They Twice a year, they are um, made to uh, fill out recertification applications. This is nefarious. There is no recourse when these people have issues that need to be addressed. When you put somebody out and you evict them, you displace them, and you slowly gentrify the community, where are we to go? I can't wait to hear what all of you have to say about this. And we need to stand up, fight back. Thank you for being here. And God bless the New York City Housing Authority and the residents that are so vital to this society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brenda, for your powerful words. Uh, people are really resonating. That's resonating with people in the chat. Uh, so I just want to let you know. 
Um, up next, we have Anthony Sanchez from Hope Gardens. His building converted in 2019, and he's going to be speaking about what's been going on over there. Anthony? Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, you hear me all right? Yep, we got you. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, like, uh, like Kristen said, I'm uh, from Bushwick over here in Hope Gardens. Uh, born and raised, been here almost 40 years. Um, and, uh, you know, just, it's it's been... Bushwick has always been beautiful, despite, you know, the challenges that we face, you know, all through the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, we're resilient people. Um, but like uh, Brenda mentioned, there's a, a lot of nefarious things going on under, you know, in the cut, like we say. And um, one of those things um, that I've been really fighting hard uh, with Senator Salazar here in uh, District 13 in Hope Gardens um, has been the, the lack of... Um, respect uh, towards residents. And uh, some of the things that I, when I say disrespect, uh, coming from Brooklyn, uh, there's, a, there's a street culture that, you know, if we talking, but you, you're not listening to a word I say, you're gonna get snuffed. Um, so like just innately within myself, this type of interaction with these people drives me insane. And it, and it brings my blood to a boil because they do, they're just kind of like just doing everything that they're doing, right? Violating our, our rights as tenants. And then it's like, we speak and we speak and they don't even pay any mind. One case in point of this was uh, during the Super Bowl in um, uh, 2019, uh, that week, we were without heat and hot water for about a week. I'm calling the management office, letting them know, hey, there's no heat and hot water. My wife, my, th uh, my, uh, my three kids were, with sweaters, hoodies, um, sweats, and quilts, taking bird baths because we got to heat up water because there's no hot water. And this is in the dead of winter, last week of January during Super Bowl, uh, during that Super Bowl Sunday. So I'm calling all week long, make about 35 phone calls, send emails. They keep saying this, they're sending a plumber. I'm calling them and they constantly, they're saying, oh, we sent someone, they fixed a the problem. And when I communicate that you have not fixed a problem, it's still an issue. Again, they just, they just kind of go through the same motions over and over again. It's not until that Sunday on the Super Bowl, I should be sitting and watching the game, but um, I'm trying to figure out how to get my family heat and hot water because it's, it's brick. So I call Senator Salazar because I met my wins end and uh, she, reaches, she gets me the contact number to the head of uh, Pinnacle, which is the management company for our complex, um, David Soris. I text him what's happening. The next day, they sent over uh, this guy named Mike and a site supervisor, and Mike was the project manager. Um, David, uh, Sal Senator Salazar's office came, representatives from the, from the office came over. And finally, they were able to identify the problem, and it was some small apparatus that just um, didn't allow the boiler to consistently inject hot water into the complex. So my next communication was, all right, so... We were able to figure out this problem in less than a day. There's such a breakdown in communication between lower level management and upper level management. And my communication to David Soris was, how can we fix this so that this doesn't continue to occur? So that this miscommunication doesn't continue to happen so that tenants don't feel like they're just being ignored and allowed to just suffer through uh, these extreme temperatures. And, and it's like, y'all are comfy, comfortable in your houses you're watching a game with some wings and, and some nice, comfortable temperature in your, in your room. You know, we're freezing over here. So how do we fix this? And, uh, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to check to see, you know, what, what happened into the communications. There was, there was no follow-up. There was no, you know, no check-in. And again, um, later on, I get COVID. I'm in a coma for three weeks. I'm intubated in the hospital. So I don't even know what's happening with my family. Um, eventually... Thank God I recover. And then recertification time. So they send over the documents. We fill them out. My wife and I are very extremely um, on top of all these things. So we, as soon as we get the paperwork, we're filling it out. We're handing everything that we need to do. So we submit it like we usually do, like through NYCHA, through the online portal. We submit everything via PDF. Um, NYCHA says it's cool. Then we get a letter of eviction from Pinnacle. And I'm like, what the hell is this? What do you mean? 
uh, please, you know, you have to, you know, contact our office immediately. This is that. And I contact them. Well, you have to uh, do recertification through us. Like I just did it through the portal. Like I usually do on NYCHA. Well, no, you have to do it twofold. You have to do it with NYCHA and you have to do it with Pinnacle. So wait, we have to do the same thing, submit the same type of paperwork to both NYCHA and Pinnacle. But what, don't you guys talk to each other? Why don't you just share the documentation that I've already submitted to them? I'm like, oh no, we have our own system in place. Fine. I submit the paperwork. With NYCHA, you have to submit a bank statement, right? I usually just give them the summary of my accounts every month, bam, and they're satisfied. With Pinnacle, they want every single page of my statement. They want to see the transactions that I do, the ins and outs. And I already have a problem with that. Like, that's none of your business. Like, I've already sent you proof of my employment, what I make salary-wise every year. Like, why do you need all this, all these intimate details? I don't really want to share with you. Oh, well, this is what we require. Yes, and yada, yada, yada. So anyway, I give in. I give them the paperwork. Certification is done. I get another letter of eviction. I'm like, what is this game? Eventually, I call in. And I'm like, oh, no, well, you know, we just need you to come in and sign the last piece of paperwork. I'm like, why didn't you just say that? Well, you know, we have to, you know, some people you have to just, you know, communicate with them in that way so to get them to react quickly. Like, no, I'm not familiar with that at all. If you tell me you require something, I'm going to meet you. We're going to talk. And then I'm going to see, but don't send me threats. Don't send me these letters of, of eviction for what I pay my rent on time. Every month I get, I, I maintain my apartment. I don't hurt anybody. I don't, I don't annoy my neighbors. I don't disturb anyone in the neighborhood. So like, don't, don't think you have to communicate to me or anyone in these buildings in this way. And then the notifications that they send us are like little slip under little letters that slipped under the door or they post it into the doorknob the what sent me over overboard was uh they they had come last week to install a thermostat in the living room and they told us oh we're you going to send a you know some guys that are going to install the thermostat that monday morning my doorbell rings and it's eight people and it's this big job that's being done I'm like this was not communicated to me like it's eight o'clock in the morning i got to take my wife to get a procedure at the at the doctor's office and i'm thinking this one guy you didn't communicate how big of a job this was what it entailed and it's the lack for me the disrespect is the lack of communication it's the it's the it's the feeling that you have that you don't need to tell me what you want to do in my space where i live and breathe where i do life and you want to come into that space and just kind of do whatever you want i have a problem with that so i went to see cesar acosta which is the uh, one of the uh, supervisors in the uh, Proceda office, which is one of the contractor company that handles the renovations. So I'm, I'm yelling, I'm screaming at everybody because at that point I'm just livid. I eventually calmed down. We were able to have a conversation. He tells me that um, he's going to put me in contact with this big meeting that they have every month with uh, local district leaders and the heads of SAV Industries, Pinnacle and Proceda. I never got any follow-up, never got any communications. I texted him last week telling him no one ever called me and communications went dead. So that's the, that's the type of interactions that we're having over here at Hope Gardens with these people. And, um, and a lot of us are extremely upset. The timeline that they promised was not upheld. Um, again, like Brenda mentioned, the, the renovations that were done, it was all topical. It was superficial. Um, you know, they called them bath fitters to kind of superimpose something that looks real sparkly and nice on top without fixing the underlying issues. Essentially, we still have pipes that back up, but I still have a bathtub that kind of doesn't flow well. Um, the cabinets that they have were extremely shoddy. Um, it's, uh, yeah, uh, they were just installed and I have one, one a shelf already uh, buckled down. So again, it's all these promises, like any politician, like even in the Caribbean, in the Dominican Republic, you know, every time election time comes around, these politicians that come around to the poor communities to hand out baskets of food, money to the residents, uh, just to get their vote for that moment. This is the same type of um, nefarious and just cynical um, tactics that they're using to the privatization, because what they want is to just be able to expel people without any type of due process. And that's what we need to be aware of. That's what people need to be cognizant um and don't sleep y'all um 
thank you and I appreciate the time and thank everybody for being here. Thank you so much, Anthony, uh, for sharing your experience um, and for those, those warnings. Up next, we have uh, Kathy Vladikis, uh, who's gonna be sharing a testimony on behalf of her ex-mother-in-law who lives in 344 East 28th Street. Uh, Kathy? Are you all set, ready? Oh, let me see, sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. All right, hi everyone. I hope everyone's being well and safe. Um, tonight, um, I sit with my, uh, my ex-mother-in-law and I am speaking on behalf of her. My name is Kathy Vladikis and I live in Queensbridge houses with my twin daughters. And tonight I'm speaking on behalf of her and she lives in 344 East 28th Street, one of the buildings that just recently went red last year in December. She's lived in her building for over 21 years and her testimony speaks to the ways RAD creates new issues while continuing the old ones. One of the first issues Sandra has was with her new witch named her deceased husband at the head of household. This remains the case even after he passed, after she passed him the death certificate. At the beginning of April, they finally took the issue on, but Sandra was still a mother. I'm sorry. Sandra was still, um, hold on, I think I maybe misprinted, no, okay. Sandra was still a month later currently withholding her correct lease. The issue here is that this should never have been an issue to begin with, nor should it take no more than a month to correct. Repairs or really, the lack therefore has been another issue. In short, not much has been done since they were converted in December. Which repairs have been made, have been done without care for the health of Sandra and her household and her neighbors. For example, they came in to measure the ca uh, kitchen cabinets, but never came back. They contacted her about painting her living room. She took all her photos down. They never came back. She contacted them multiple times about a hole in her tub. It's been three months, still no repairs have been made. They came to fix the mold in the bathroom. All they did was paint over it. The black spots are coming back now. They also, have not fixed the vents in the bathroom yet, which would help the mold. Her building has no bathroom windows. So there's supposed to be um, um, a fan system for NYCHA houses. And I guess, you know, the ones that converted red, there's supposed to be a fan system on top of the building, which that probably never got fixed. They did come to address the lead in the apartment within a 24 hour notice. While Sandra went out most of the day, the other members of the household, including the baby at the time, which was 10 months, 10 months old, and were all on the premises all day and were not advised to leave as they should have been. And it's not because it wasn't dangerous. In fact, when Sandra returned, they were still finishing up. She still waited in the hallway because the smell was making her feel sick. Shortly after she entered her apartment, she collapsed and had to go to the emergency room. Sandra also said they were doing lead abatement in common areas, in hallways, by the incinerators, without any advanced warning for residents, despite the risk of their health. Sandra also mentioned that the most of the workers she encountered did not speak English, which makes this difficult for residents like Sandra, who only speaks English, to know that it's ongoing in their home and even to get answers about who's coming in and out of their homes. Further still, there is suspicion amongst residents that workers being hired in the private managers do not have the proper paperwork or certifications to carry out this work in their homes and in the buildings, nor work in the United States. Another issue is the rodent infestation continue to be a problem for residents. 
Sandra's neighbors have been complaining to the management about a mice problem for the longest time. She has pointed out the hole in the wall several times, but still hasn't been taking care of it properly. And they just need to keep giving her poison for now. The neighbor feels for the safety of her children, for her two-year-old and her 13-year-old. The last thing we'll mention this evening are the regular elevator outages. Almost every weekend in the building that has 26 floors, while often she is away on the weekends visiting her mother, her son and wife are regularly having to hike up 14 flights of stairs with their 10-month-old and the stroller. What does this mean for seniors, folks who are disabled? What is it, uh, what is it breaks while are they out? How do they get home? So basically she's, this building just went rad in December and it's the same shenanigans or it's just getting worse, you know? And, you know, she complains and yet still gets ignored. People knock on the door with either less than 24 hour notice or uh, a big major notice, you know, two day notice. And it's, it's not right that these private management companies are taking advantage of, you know, people and their rights and trying to scare them with, you know, either evictions or notices or, you know, disturbance, whatever it is. I mean, she hasn't experienced any harassment, but, you know, um, it's a shame that she's going through this. Okay, thank you so much for that, Kathy. And just to people's questions in the chat, she was speaking about 344 East 28th Street. Um, so up next, I'm gonna read um, some testimonies that were submitted um, they're going to be read anonymously. Uh, the residents in these buildings, they have converted to RAD, but they don't feel comfortable uh, sharing their name or the name of their development because of fear of retaliation and because they have to live in these buildings. So um, these are written firsthand, so I'm going to read them as though I am that tenant. I'll just a uh, heads up, but um, you know, anyways. Um, so first, I won't deny that our buildings have been cleaner than they were under NYCHA lately, but the transition has not been easy. Before the transition, NYCHA and the private management company held meetings to speak about RAD Pact. Our community was invited to those meetings. We asked questions and got some answers. People mostly became excited when they saw the renderings of how our apartments would look after renovations. Uh, when the transition began, we received new appliances and painting happened, as we were told. However, the paint job was pretty poorly done and some things felt almost half-assed done. Paint began shipping uh, quickly. There were unpainted spots. The pictures we saw uh, didn't really look like what we were received. It took a lot of work for us to move our furniture out of the way to get painters in here. So we didn't want to go through asking for yet another coat of paint when we noticed that the paint job uh, when we noticed the paint job was chipping uh, after having gone through after having just gone through this process. A huge issue in a lot of our buildings is the plumbing. Our pipes were very old and often le uh, led to leaking even under NYCHA. Several neighbors have experienced leaking from within the walls and from their ceilings. At least two neighbors have shared that they had to literally use umbrellas to use the bathroom. Some of us also experience clogging, backed up pipes where dirty water and even food from other apartments is rising up in our showers and laundry water rises up in our sinks. These issues have long been affecting us here under NYCHA and I'm not sure if these are among the issues that, they ha that have been addressed or prioritized for us as tenants under the new privatization with packed red. I don't recall any mentions about the inside of the buildings at any of the meetings that we had with NYCHA or the private management company. Molding has been, mold has been an issue with vents not properly working and it seems that instead of rectifying the issue of mold correctly, they just paint over it. Some neighbors have complained about uh, having contacted management for repairs, but they either don't come or they do little to nothing to fix the issues. It appears that ticket delays do not end with NYCHA. We have experienced a lack of hot water, no hot water one day, lack of hot water during construction. Our kitchen took months to get fixed 
months of our food uh, splayed out in our living room and lack of communication from the new management company. All of this makes us wonder if Rad Pact has the funding to make a full plumbing update and truly get uh, below the surface in our centuries old buildings neglected under NYCHA. We just received surveys in English and Spanish to share our experience under a pact rather and hopefully people participated in theirs. Another tenant from the same building says, um, since the private management took over, I have experienced that they're inefficient with, inefficient with repairs. My complaint is that they aren't that efficient when they have to call in a contractor. If a contractor needs to be called for repairs, they don't call to let you know when they're coming. Sometimes they say they're coming a certain day and show up another time or day. When I spoke to certain contractors, uh, it seems like there's not much communication in terms of scheduling. Management tells them the tenants, a, tells the tenant a date, a time without confirming with them. Uh, my door needed to be replaced and they did a good job. However, here we are eight months later and no one has come to paint the outside of the door or the borders. I asked two times within the last month and the reply was that they're out of that color paint and are awaiting the end order to arrive. I'm guessing that that paint is extremely hard to get or maybe due to COVID things are backed up. I'm concerned that they, are, uh, that they covered my AC vents with a metal cover and said that when summer comes, they'll get it removed. I hope I don't have to wait until summer is over for them to remove it. Also, if you, uh, call in regards to any rent situation, they'll ask you to come in. And then after looking a few hours of work because you had an appointment, they'll tell you they can't help you and to reach out to section eight. Lastly, I believe there's a, oh, I'm not gonna read that part because it names people. Um, and then the third tenant also a very quick, quick uh, statement. Um, so they should have repaired the first, the inner parts of the building, getting rid of the nasty rusty old pipes and other interior situations the building might have, then work and repair to the outer parts of the building. Instead, they pri prioritize the outer parts of the building. They sent like three plumbers and a handyman, and finally the last plumber after two years came to fix it. Looks like they finally sent some real plumbers and after having a leak for two years that all the water falls on me, uh, they found now they broke the wall and tomorrow they have to put in new pipes. Um, the pipes are real rotten and old. I can't use my washing machine. There's something stuck in the pipe. When I wash and spin, the water comes up and, and they know this. And so it's kind of a similar story of, you know, repairs not being met, but also I think uh, the fact that the outside of the buildings is being prioritized um, over the inside of the buildings. Um, okay, up next we have uh, Chris Banks from Boulevard Houses. Chris, are you on the call still? Uh, let's see. Just give me one minute. Yep, don't need Oh, great. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> hey, how you doing? Good night, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Chris Banks. Um, I'm a, not a resident of Boulevard Houses, but I'm an activist, a housing activist, uh, uh, predominantly throughout East New York, um, organizing uh, and fighting for residents in East New York, um, particularly in the NYCHA developments. Um, specifically, I'm actually also a, the chair of the board of directors for the Boulevard Nursery, which is located in Boulevard Houses. And uh, Boulevard, uh, that particular daycare has been there since 1972. It's interesting because I actually uh, was a, um, a a student at that at that nursery, and now I'm the chair of the board of directors. Um, but Boulevard has been going through the uh, uh, actually is part of the PAC program now, or this PAC conversion. I call it the uh, PAC of Hell, um, and we. Recently, for a couple, actually a couple of months back, at the Boulevard, we, the Board of Directors got a letter from the uh, new management that they were actually going to terminate our lease. Uh, and the letter read, please be advised that the Boulevard is scheduled to undergo this permanent affordability commitment, in the PAC version to Section 8 uh, in the late, in late 2019, 2020. 
As such, NYCHA will be entering into public-private partnership with a development team who will be your landlord post-conversion. Because of such conversions, NYCHA will not be entering into any new or renewal leases at Boulevard. Your tenancy will remain month to month basis until such conversions is final and the new landlord will inform you if you will be offered a new lease. Um, then they said, you know, if you wish to vacate the premise uh, before such conversions is complete, please let us know in 30 days um, in advance. And when I saw the letter, I was mad as hell. Cause I said, how the hell can these folks come into our community and tell us that they're not gonna renew our lease. We've been in this community. I am born and raised out here. This particular daycare has been there since 1972, 1970. And for them to come and tell us, speak to us as though they are the, uh, the new lords of the land and that they're telling us uh, uh, that we're not going to renew your lease or, or, or and, and just the language uh, that you can vacate the premise. I said, hell no. I said, this, this not, not only uh, is this particular uh, pack or this quote unquote conversion or partnership, is it just affecting the tenants on the resident side, but it's affecting every aspect of life in public housing and in the out, outer parts of the community because this daycare services over close to 120 20 students. And they, a majority of them live in boulevard houses and the surrounding communities. This, this, this is an attack on, on poor folks, poor black folks, let's be real. This is a declaration of war on folks who they feel can't fight back. And we sent a letter to them and we said, we're not respecting your letter, one, I don't wanna, I don't wanna paraphrase, and two, that we're gonna to continue to pay what we've been paying as far as the rent. And we were, we were not gonna to subscribe to their threats and demands and that we were gonna continue because this is a community daycare center, it's service in the community, and we've been here for so many years and we're not going anywhere. And, you know, then we got calls on, you know, they were gonna, uh, they wanted to come in, look at the center. They wanted to give us a new brand new playground and fix the kitchen and all this. But I said to the board, I said, we, 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 I said, listen, we know what we got, but we don't know what we are gonna get. And they wanna, they wanna uh, uh, say now, well, they wanna fix the play, playground and do all this stuff. I said, Listen, keep your small talk, keep your, 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 your little trinkles that you're now trying to throw at us. Um, and if, if you really want to talk, come to the table, give us a, right now, our rent, we pay about $1,900 in rent. And we've been paying, we've had that lease since the, well, going back over 10, 15, 20 years. We haven't, the rent has not been increased. And the daycare is a pretty big daycare for what we're paying. And I know they want to raise the rent. I know for sure that once they fix the playground, they give us a brand new kitchen, they do all these quote unquote uh, things that they're throwing at us, that they're going to raise the rent. And I said, well, listen, if we take their carrots and they throw this at us, then we are just as dumb and stupid. So I said, no. I said, we don't need them to come in and fix the playground. We don't need them to come. And 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 um, fix the, uh, the the kitchen. We, we, we've been managing thus far, even under the conditions, the poor conditions that we've been subjected to till night to, to NYCHA. But we know for sure that the rent has has been affordable, and we've been able to provide a service to the community and assist uh, so many young folks who've come through there. I've come through, uh, uh, you know, come through the Boulevard Nursery. And all right, that, but I said, we want to make a commitment, if anything, that they keep the rent the same 
because I believe they get a, 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 a they they get a tax credits and and and, and protections that is going on 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years down the road. Well, they need to make sure that there's the same protections are given to those uh, who are who are who are who are in the uh, parts of the, the different real estate that are in the NYCHA developments. So I fundamentally am against the PAC program, the RAD program. Uh, and this, and, and my, my, my perspective is not only just on the tenant side also, but it's also on being a, a, a CBO who's renting and seeing how they are, uh, that displacement is across the board, that they want to displace folks, that they want to keep poor folks poor. And we have to, we, like Brenda said, and I think it, 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 to me it's a, it's a resounding message, we got to fight, 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 fight. Um, and not just fight, but also hold folks accountable. I know there's no mayoral candidate that I know that I've seen that had, that truly has a heart for nature. And all the electeds, I think they all are sellouts because a lot of them behind the scenes, they're saying, oh, well, we're not for the RAD program. We're not for the PAC program, but they're not doing anything. To stop it, they're not. They're not. Uh, they're, they're, you call their offices too for help, and it's to no avail. And it's just a continuous cycle of 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 what we the abuse that we've been receiving from NYCHA. But again, at least we know with NYCHA, their regs that are there that establish and engages the tenants. There's, there's something we can fight on. With this new management coming in, all that is ripped up in shreds. There's no engagement of the community. You've, you've heard the examples of residents going to the office and asking for assistance and they're telling them to go to Section 8. Well, why the hell did you become the management? Why did you take over the, the, uh, the development then? If we got to go to Section 8. We don't need you to tell us that. We can figure that out ourselves. So this fake partnership, this pact from hell, is just a, 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 a it's, it's, it, it really is a move to complete the job and completely annihilate the last place or the last bastion of affordable housing in the city of New York. That's basically what it is. What it is. Uh, this is a big facade. It's a, it's a nightmare that they're forcing down the throats of residents uh, throughout the city, black and brown folks. And this is a this is a, a declaration of war on poor folks. And people got to wake up. People have to wake up and see this. And I'm glad that this troop commission has been brought together because we get to see in different parts and nicks and crannies of the city that it's being replicated all over. And that these tenant associations and some of these fake leaders who are disconnected from the masses who are saying, oh, well, it's better than what we had before. Uh, they're, they're painting this, they're doing this, they're doing that. They, there's some serious issues there that we got it. We have to deal with internally. And that is something that I think is, 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 is to me more also important too. So I just wanted to give my perspective um, from, from East New York here on, at Boulevard Houses. We have three developments, it's Boulevard, Linden Houses, and Pemberton Houses recently, who is being, uh, is, 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 they're attempting to convert and bring under these particular programs. And um, I'm telling the residents every day, fight, fight, fight. Um, uh, you know, get your voice out there and don't, 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 don't be afraid because yes, they may feel, you know, the big, big management companies, see all these white folks now coming around, running around the development, uh, you know, trying to do this, do that. And just, it's, it's, it, listen, fight. And I think if anything else, fight, fight, fight. And I think that's, that's the message that I wanted to bring tonight. Uh, we have to, we just have to fight. We got to organize and we have to have an independent movement can't be tied to any political agendas, uh, but the, the, the it, political in nature, yes, but it has to be 
to fight and make sure that NYCHA, that we stop uh, the, the, the privatization of NYCHA and that we keep NYCHA publicly managed and we deal with the systemic issues that's plaguing NYCHA on the public side with NYCHA as it is currently. So, thank you um, so much. Yeah, that's thank you. Um, Let's continue to fight and organize. Thank you so much, Chris. That was really uh, inspiring and helpful for perspective. Um, and up next, we're gonna have uh, Vanessa Walsh from Harlem River Houses. I'm just gonna try and find you. And Vanessa, are you still here? I'm here. Oh, there you are. Gotcha. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay you're on. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to make a brief statement. As a resident of Harlem River Houses, we here, I haven't had the, the problems with the heating and the, the problems that I'm hearing that other, you know, developers have, and I'm thankful for that. But the harassment that we've been going through on a daily basis from these people is, is really unreal. Every day or every other day, someone is knocking on my door to sign this, or we want to come and fix that. Somebody came the other day, they wanted to come paint. I didn't sign anything for you to come and paint. Just basically bullying tactics. And a lot of the tenants, they are afraid to speak up because they think they're going to lose their homes. But the, the bottom line is you're going to wind up losing your home anyway if you sign this bogus lease that they want from CNC management, whom I've done some research about them. They are a very unscrupulous management company that uses bullying tactics with a lot of other buildings outside of NYCHA to, to remove tenants. They don't make repairs. So basically, like the young man said prior to me speaking, we just all have to come together, fight, march, sue, you know, get a lawyer, like as we have done, we retain the lawyer so that we can try to block this and stop this from going on, because a lot of people are going to lose their homes. I know for a fact that I believe it was Brooklyn and in Queens, over 80 tenants were evicted from their homes after signing these leases and after being told that they can have Section 8 and they can move anywhere they want as long as they stay in NYCHA for another year, which is not true. Once they sign and take the Section 8, they don't even give them a time, you know, time to get a place, even if that's such the case, but that's not really the case. The, 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 the Section 8 is just like, uh, it's bogus. Is really bogus because Section 8 is technically closed. So I just that's why I just wanted to say that, that you know, no one should be intimidated to fight. Because if you want to stay in your home and keep your home, don't join up with PAC. Don't give don't give in to signing a lease with CNC management because you will be losing your home. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for those wise words, Vanessa. Uh, and thank you for joining us this sure. evening. Um, and for sharing your experience. Um, up next, and the last two tenants to speak from New York, we have um, Mary Hicks and Jackie Laura from Fulton Houses. Mary, you're gonna go first. So these tenants have been fighting against privatization at Fulton Houses for the last two years, actually more than two years at this point, I think. So Mary, are you good to go? I think it looks like you're on mute still right now. You're good now, I think. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, we're good to go. All right. So what I want to say is, first, I'm going to start with rat pack. Don't want it. First thing is that if they come in and disturb our floors, I'm not going to cut my phone. Disturb our floors and put in whatever they want to put in, they're disturbing what we have that is fireproof. We are, our, our apartments are fireproof. It is contained to our apartments once we go on fire. The, 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 your next floor doesn't burn and the person underneath you doesn't burn. And if you run out the door, close the door, it's contained in your apartment. Okay, a lot of people don't know. So the other thing that I want to say is that you have to fight for what you have. 
okay? Because what, what, what we have here is, you know, people didn't want Section 8. That's why we went housing. You don't have to pay light and gas and things. And we stay at 30%. You know, Section 8, like, 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 um, like the one listen from um, Harlem River said, you know, they, they just want to come in and do what they want to do. They want to vote on it. See what, what, what I'm going to do for them is that tomorrow morning, because I, I was there and I spoke to the police and I told the police, it's stupid. Okay. The reason why is this being the NCOs came out, which is called neighborhood community offices from PSA 6. Now, regardless of whatever her name is, the TA president, I'll give her name, is this. You can call whoever you want to call, but we was on city ground. That's why I told him I'll be the first one to go to jail because you're going to pay me because I'm in the parks department. You cannot arrest me unless you're a parks department officer. Housing is across the street. So now if a housing police officer wants to step on um, city parks department without probable cause, like, like if he saw a gun or something, I don't know how to stop something like that. I'm just saying they're protesting. We have, we have permits. They have no right. Okay, so they don't know that, you know, the cops don't know their rights. The residents don't know that all you have to do is call through, the call the 718 number, give me your name and your address, and tell them whatever the PDA president, whatever her name is, that she was out there Saturday threatening you with the police. Your, your Lord, the, um, Arthur Schwartz had to jump in it. You know, Mary Hicks from, from Fulton Houses is also going to make a complaint, and that this is corruption. She did not do that to you. Okay, see, see, the other mis misconception here is this with the TA. The TAs don't run nothing. Let me a, a lot, let me say that aloud again, because that's why I want you to come to Fulton House, because there's dead people in Fulton House. Swear to God that Miguel runs nothing. Miguel will run shit down here. Okay, because our, our housing workers go into the homes and the tenants are telling them they're going to tell Miguel. Miguel don't run nothing. He don't run nothing in housing. You know? And and the thing here is, is if, if your TA president was so much with you, regardless, like forget the pack and the rack and all that stuff. Just to keep your keep the, the development the way it's supposed to work, they can do that and call it in and complain about it. But other than that, they don't control the workers enough. And that's what these silly people down here think you're crazy with Miguel. And, and and I'm gonna propose that we when we do get a proposal that like this, if we win, hopefully we will. I'm, Everybody that, oh, see, so this is what he spoke to. He wants to stay neutral in the matter. He should have said, How many people for PAC? How many people for PAC? And I'm staying neutral. I'm not going to tell you which way I'm going. I'm going to tell this group what to do and what this group is supposed to do. That's what he was supposed to do. So, my thing is this I'm going to find out how many for PAC and how many for public. When we go public, guess what? Bug it now. Bye. I'm going to put this project that has PAC. And you can take Miguel with you in July. Because I turned Miguel in to the Inspector General's office as well as Patrick Chen. So that's why, along with the lawsuit we have for the rats and something else going on on, on 19th Street, that's why they ain't here going crazy. That's why they're painting it all. This, that, and third, and all that. Really, inspection stopped. Patrick Chen took over from Renee Wright and the projects went down. All right, I'm out. That's my progress. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so oh, much. I gotta cut my mic. Oh, okay. Thank you so much uh, for okay. sharing that. I really appreciate it. Um, up next, we have Jackie Laura. Um, Jackie, are you still on the line? Yes, I am. Hi, guys. Okay. You hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I'm putting it at oh. Um. Anyway, my name is Jackie Lara. I'm from Fulton Houses, and um, I've been the main activist there for over two years. In 2019, um, Miguel Acevedo had told us um, that our we were they're going to demolish my building and the one on 19th Street, and and he and they were going to turn our development into pack rat. And as soon as we heard that, we started protesting. I think that was like in December, November of 2019. In January, we started protesting till today. Um, we've gone to every elected officials and begged them. We went to community board four, which there are a bunch of racists in there. They, they act like they were listening, but nobody was listening to us. Uh, the elected officials as well, they're all playing deaf. 
I don't know what proposal is there for them, but I'm sure there's big money coming in that none, none of them want to listen to us. Um, as we were protesting, um, we, they, de Blasio put this working group together. Now, according to this working group, we were supposed to, you know, uh, all compromise and see how we could save Fulton houses. And um, as the meeting was, uh, as we started this work, I really didn't want to deal with the working group because I already knew they were all full of shit. Full of it, full of it. Sorry, excuse my language. They were all full of it. And um, as the time started going, I, we 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 got Norman Siegel, which he was representing us at the time, and he, and he came with another lawyer and told him that it's worked out for resident management. And um, they didn't want to hear him. They mocked him, and as a matter of fact, they threw him out of the meeting. They were really disrespectful. I was so embarrassed. This was NYCHA, elective officials. They were just like really disrespectful to this man. We also proposed that maybe um, since we there isn't no money, maybe we could get everybody's rent and you could open um, Fulton House's own bank account and all that money that allocates in, we could start fixing Fulton Houses. That didn't work for them. They didn't want to hear any kind of proposal. All they wanted to hear was what their voices and what they want to do. And right now, um, um, the working group, I left because I saw that we weren't being heard. They didn't care what, what I wanted or what we wanted to do to save Fulton. Their intentions were never to save Fulton Houses or Chelsea. And I felt that the working group was just to silence us so we could stop protesting. But we still kept protesting after that. And um, and it, it, it became very frustrating and depressing for me. I'm away now because I needed a break from all that protesting for two years and a half and no one listening to us and nobody caring. All I keep hearing is, oh, Obama did this. Ah. Obama, Obama. Jackie, you're, you're muted now. Jackie, I'm sorry. Go back to the Obama <laughs> after you unmute yourself. Okay. Good. You know, um, how many, now you hear me? You yep. hear me now, Kristen? Yep. Yep. Um, you know how many presidents we've had and uh, we don't agree with them of any decisions they make. So what's the big deal with Obama? Okay, so what? He, he, he wanted Rat Pack because I guess he wanted to get this out of the way or whatever. But that doesn't mean we have to agree with him and take away public housing. Listen, this is the only thing we have that's affordable. And even if I was to move on, at least my kids could live there and afford it on um, living in, at least um, working in Costco or whatever, you know, at least they could afford the rent there. My kids, if, if, they definitely, if this was to go pack rad, they definitely won't be able to live there. They've got to give us a chance and give public housing a chance. And they just can't take this away from us. And you know what? They actually bullied us. They took... They took the development from us, where, and we have signatures. We got 600 signatures of head of households that don't want Brad Pack, and we also have 400 from the community that are willing to support us on this, and they still don't want to listen. They threw away, as a matter of fact, they threw away those signatures. We gave it to Orderberry, which is the chief of staff of Nadler. We gave it to him, and he threw it away, I guess, because you know that, that, that signatures don't exist anymore. I've, I've done everything I could possibly do. I right, come on. We've done everything we possibly could do to save public housing, to save Fulton, to save Chelsea, and we are on deaf ears. And I've reached out to everybody. I mean, Kristen, everybody. And, you know, there's, they, they just say, no, 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 they don't care. They're going to do it no matter what. And that is my piece. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Jackie. Thank you for sharing that, Jackie. Oh, I am having some feedback. Oh, I am having some feedback. Can you all hear oh. that repeating? I'm so sorry. Well, I'm going to do this really quickly and transfer it over to uh, Ryan, actually, who's going to take over the second half of the meeting. And he's going to introduce us to some tenants who are joining us from Boston, Minneapolis, and also from the Bay Area. Uh, Ryan, are you there? Yeah, thanks so much, Kristen, for uh, passing off. And thank to everyone who's spoken so far. It's so powerful to hear what you all had to say. So my name is Ryan. I'm an organizer with the United Front Against Displacement in Boston. Some of you may know Abby and Akiva, 
James and EJ, who are in New York, uh, uh, and, and others. Um, we also have organizers in, in the Bay Area. Uh, it was so powerful to hear all the testimonies from, from, from residents and to, sorry, my cats, are, you might hear some background noise, they're playing with the bag, um, to hear all the testimonies from residents. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, in New York City, you're not alone. There's an emerging nationwide movement to oppose RAD, PACT, and all these privatization schemes. You know, we ourselves in the United Front Against Displacement learned so much from the Defend Glendale and Public Housing Coalition, who we'll hear from in, in a few minutes. Um, and, you know, people all across the country are standing up together to oppose these things. And uh, there's also places where people have even been uh, privatized to one degree or another and are fighting, continue to fight back. Um, so we're going to go through a few different locations and hear from a few organizers who will introduce the situation in the different locations, and then we'll hear from some residents. Uh, and you know, I think one thing just to keep in mind, and it's it's important to emphasize, even if you're just one person or a couple people at your building and you have you're standing up against it, or you want to stand up against rad and pact, like you're not really alone. There's a lot of other people in New York. There's a lot of other people across the country who will stand with you. And if you from a few people that snowball gets rolling and there's a lot of momentum because this, this stuff is not in people's interest. Um, and, you know, in some cities uh, like Boston, they're using a mix of RAD and Section 18 and other things similar to what's going on with PACT and Blueprint for Change in New York. And in the Bay, there's some unique stuff which we'll hear about because of uh, the program called Hope SF, which is based off the old notorious Hope 6 program, but specially modified for San Francisco. And what we see consistently, and what you all are already aware, is that a lot of this uh, public housing is on prime real estate. And powerful and wealthy developers, along with their political uh, allies in the government, elected officials, and the banks really are working to grab this as a major land grab. And in fact, many of the nonprofits, if you dig into them a little bit, you find out that their major equity investors are none other than the banks like Bank of America, JP Morgan, Chase, TD Bank, State Street, and so on. So with that brief introduction, I will pass it off to, I believe up first is Alonso, who's a United uh, member of the United Front Against Displacement in Boston, and he'll be introducing the situation in Boston a little bit more. Okay, Alonso, let me just have you on mute. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Alonzo uh, here in Boston. Um, so I, I guess I'll give a, a brief overview of uh, the situation here in Boston and how it relates to stuff going on nationally. Uh, so here, the, the United Front Against Displacement, we've been working primarily in two developments. Um, one is uh, Lenox, the, the Lenox Street Housing Project, one of the first four uh, public housing project built in Boston. And it has been privatized. It was going to be privatized under RAD, but now it's changed. Uh, and it's been given over to uh, Beacon, a developer, and Bank of America. Bank of America is the main owner of the buildings. Um, and uh, the other place is uh, across the street. Uh, we've been working, yeah, both of us have been working with, with residents. Um, yeah, uh, the second place is uh, Grant Manor, uh, which is uh, a subsidized development uh, under a project based like Section 8 uh, assistance. But so the main things I hope to get across are uh, what the privatization of Lenox can tell us uh, about uh, what's going on just nationally, because it, I think, captures some disturbing trends that are going on. Um, and second, the relationship between the struggles of subsidized developments like Rent Manor and public housing projects, because they're somewhat different, but they're actually very closely related. And um, yeah, we have some uh, residents from Lenox and from Grant Manor who can talk more a bit about the, the specific situations there too. Uh, but so to start with the uh, privatization, you know, we, we heard about RAD and about how many cities have uh, plans to get rid of a large part, if not their whole public housing stock with RAD. Uh, and in Massachusetts is the same and Boston is, is the same. There are several uh, buildings that are being targeted by RAD and Lenox was one of those, uh, but uh, that has changed is actually they've managed to make things worse. Uh, at Lenox and at a bunch of other places in Boston. Because, um, you know, we, we all know RAD is terrible and, and we know that the protections that it has for residents are on paper and they're violated all the time, but it does have some protections on paper. Uh, but what they're gonna do at Lenox, uh, what they actually did, they just did at Lenox uh, is privatize it through section 18, which does not have even on paper, you know, the, 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 the protections that RAD claims to have. 
and which are violated all the time under RAD, but it doesn't even have those on paper under Section 18. Um, and uh, um, yeah, you know, basically Section 18 is just the section of the housing law that, that regulates how public housing agencies like NYCHA and, Bo and BHA in Boston and all these others can get rid of, of public housing by demolishing or, or, or selling. Um, and uh, yeah, it doesn't have nearly the same protections and it makes the public housing projects that get privatized even more of a cash cow. Um, so yeah, to, to be brief, uh, um, yeah, so, uh, 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 yeah, anyway, so sorry. Uh, 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 yeah, so anyway, so, sorry. So in, in Boston, Lenox and several other developments that were gonna be privatized under RAD are now not being privatized under RAD because HUD opened the floodgates and said, actually, you know, you can just go ahead and use section 18, which has fewer protections and which gives you more money uh, uh, if you want. Um, and that was like two years ago. And so for example, at Lenox, uh, uh, the new owners, Beacon and Bank of America are gonna get $3,400 per th for every three bedroom uh, under the HAP contract. Under RAD, they would have gotten 1,800. So they just get, it's just a way to get, you know, to, to fork over more money to them um, without, and, and to protect tenants even less. Um, so uh, yeah, so anyway, I wanted to share that because I think it's something that's gonna, that is happening all over Boston and it's probably gonna be happening all over the country since they've, yeah, HUD just opened the floodgates in this way. Uh, and uh, to say a few things about Grant Manor, you know, Grant Manor is a little bit different. It's in a slightly different boat, uh, but um, you see the same patterns of how government conspires to turn government assistance for, for residents, for, you know, for, for housing into just a cash cow for these banks and developers. Uh, because at Grant Manor, they got a big rent increase under their section eight thing where, um, uh, residents, there are a few residents who don't have Section 8, eight uh, and they're just going to be paying a lot more. And then the government is going to be paying uh, uh, the partners at Grant Manor, these banks, and the management company, Wingate, a lot more. Um, but basically, Grant Manor, so it wasn't public housing, but it was built uh, privately, but with HUD money. Uh, and this was in the 70s, at the time when HUD decided, actually, we don't want to do public housing anymore. We're going to just let the private sector take over. And so um, they stopped building public housing. They started giving money to private developers to build public housing. And of course, they just ran these places to the ground. Uh, Grant Manor and a bunch of other buildings got owned by this absentee landlord, this slumlord from California, ran it to the ground. It was, you know, uh, 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 so, you know, all these lies about the private sector being better is really shown by, I think, the story at, at Grant Manor. And then residents organized for a long time um, to, uh, uh, for HUD to take back over the, these developments and then to sell them to the residents. Because usually HUD in this case uh, takes over and then sells it to another slumlord. That's what they usually do. But residents in Boston organized against that and they got, uh, they got them to, to sell to uh, resident organizations at Grant Manor and a bunch of other developments in the same boat. Um, but, you know, over time, HUD finds a way to, and, and the powers that be find a way to chip away at people's victories. And so, you know, the struggle there, which Jackie can talk a bit more about, um, has to do with, with uh, fighting this corrupt board that, that had partial ownership and that you know, has just become actually a toady for Wingate in the banks. Um, Alonso, just and, to jump uh, in, it's, a, it's been five minutes, you gotta wrap up. Yeah. So if you sure. just have the yeah. next 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was it. Uh, so, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, Thanks, hello. Alonso. And sorry to jump in. Uh, I forgot to mention I'm going to be doing a thing for people speaking. I'm going to be at roughly, you know, five minutes. So I'm going to be holding up, you know, three minutes, two minutes, one minute as we approach. And uh, then if you finish, I'll jump in, let you know um, if there's no more time. Uh, thank you so much, Alonso. Uh, so now we're going to hear from Jackie, who is one of the residents at Grant Manor. As Alonso mentioned, Grant Manor is a uh, subsidized development under the Section 8 project based vouchers that receives. Uh, there's 180 units there and the vast majority receive uh, people residents receive uh, a subsidy through section eight, but now they're facing a big rent increase. Uh, and they've been fighting to uh, prevent that and to get all the repairs needed, uh, because much like with privatization they've been told well these this rent increase will help fix the repairs, but the repairs haven't happened for quite a while. It's my turn now. Yeah, you're up Jackie. Oh, okay. 
Hi, um, like I said, my name is Jackie. Um, so yeah, like they said, uh, like Ryan stated, um, I believe the plan is to just let, to just run the building into the ground, to run people away, to divide and conquer, because I guess they figured uh, residents would wanna move if you were getting threatened or if you live in uh, a building and you see that repairs aren't getting done. Uh, we've been harassed, we've been threatened um, by management. Um, really like they shouldn't have their jobs, but they do, even though they physically have, they've been threatening and trying to fight people like literally trying to fight people. Um, I've reported floods and my roof leaking uh, countless times, but it's not until you get a bigger organization going that people really begin to listen to you because you're kind of just like this one, This you're just one little person complaining all the time or even calling, um, even calling down to the office or um, calling um, one of the state sites, you know, it's just literal you. So they always just try to go against you and basically, basically just tell you no to everything because they figure you have no proof and it's just you. And what are you going to prove? There's no way you can prove um, everything to anyone if it's just one person, but there's, I believe that's just the plan. Um, because if you have a whole team, you have a whole team of security, you have janitors that are here every day from like seven to 5 p.m. Um, you have maintenance, you know, why aren't they fixing things properly? Like you see other, I see other de um, developments sometimes they have, when they have a bigger issue that maintenance can't fix, they call in whatever professionals they need to call in um, to fix it. Like uh, the leaks where um, we've had major leaks for maybe like a year where I couldn't even go out into the hallway and leave my house because the whole area where the elevators were was, was just flooded um, with just, you know, that whole area was just flooded. And the only other option was uh, the stairs. Um, but if you have major water issues in your building, in your apartment, think about the health risk. Um, think about the health risk. Like, how are you contributing to uh, people's health risks? And, you know, that's another issue in itself that's not being addressed. Um, I have mold in my bathroom right now. I've had mold since I've been here. It's hidden under some type of... Um, some type of hardened material, but it's actually going, growing through that. Um, and it's black mold um, and the rats, you know, uh, and, and roaches. Um, they, but, but again, they, get, they receive a lot of money from the residents and uh, from the city. So it's kind of like, why aren't you fixing these issues, which is probably to just run the building into the ground and say they these are the well we have so many issues here that we this is our only this is our only uh plan now this is what we have to do um but people have been talking about these things for years you know so yeah i think the plan is to just run the buildings into the ground to do whatever they want to do to the building, um, to move people wherever, and maybe eventually tell them, oh, they can't move back or something, and to turn the building into something else, or yeah, to basically turn the building into something else. You know, if you're not considered a so called elite, if you're not making such amount of money, even though you are, but your money is just going to wherever it needs to go to, to bills, food or whatever. And you're just not making that, that extra profit that maybe 
um, the wealthier people are making. Um, yeah, and we're spending more money and, you know, the wealthy doesn't spend as much on taxes and things, you know, as the working class does. Um, so, yeah. So I'm glad we just have a whole group to fight against that. Thank you so much, Jackie. Well said. Uh, ne next up is, is Raisa from uh, from Lennox, Lennox Street Projects, which are right across the road from Grant Manor. There's 285 units there. And as Alonso mentioned, they were being privatized under RAD. And then without notifying any residents, everything was changed to Section 18. Uh, and as Raisa will explain, the situation is, is, is pretty rough there. But people are coming together. So in that sense, it's not so rough. Hi, everybody. Um, good night. My name is Raisa. I live in Lenox, uh, developing in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I want to share with you uh, re real quick my experience here. Um, sorry for my English. My English is not too good. It's not too good looking, okay? <laughs> and then um, I got three or uh, two years here. Um, and then I'm very, very blessed that I find this group that will fight for people like me. Um, I'm a mother of three kids and my experience here in Lenox development have been very, very difficult. I've been experienced a racist, um, racist. Um, I've been experienced um, harassment um not hot water sometimes for my kids um and a lot of a lot of problems arise around the development it's very sad for me because i'm this kind of people who help my neighbors and then i'm being um helping a lot of neighbors in my building fight with the office um of this development and then um uh, it's very sad because before I met you guys, I didn't understand what's going on around me. And then I was asking myself, why these people treated me like this um, um, with this hate inside? And it, I don't understand. And um, when I met you guys, so you direct me exactly in the point. So what's going on here? And it's, and it's very, very sad because I didn't know all this information that you guys share with me and I really appreciate it. And then uh, I feel very lucky to be in this uh, organization. And then um, I just wanna tell you guys, don't give up. I'm a single mom of three kids and I've been through a lot here. And I wish I could have the time to tell you everything that I experienced here. But I had to tell you that it's been very hard. But the important thing is I'm a strong woman and I'm in the right place with you guys. And I will fight to the end for my rights and your rights, okay? And um, it's pretty much that's it. It's my first um, uh, conversation in front of a lot of people in virtual. But um, like I say, be strong people. Um, don't give up. Don't be afraid to talk. That's the important thing. I'm not afraid of nobody in here, in this development, especially the security guards. Um, because I've been, have, I've been intimidated by the security around here and it's not right. These people have guns and all that. So I've been doing everything I had to say, uh, do, and I've been, and I've been saying everything I had to say um, to the office and without no fear and one more, one more, Things that I say, don't give up and be strong. Have a great night. Thank you for opportunity. And nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you so much, Raisa, for speaking. And, and your English is great. There's no need to apologize. Mucho mejor que mi español, you know, so. Oh, it's perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> right, gracias, gracias. Okay, next up we have Laden from Defend Glendale Public Housing Coalition in Minneapolis. And I personally don't know Laden, uh, but a number of other people in my organization have spoken with her a number of times. And she's been a tremendous help for us in, in clarifying so, so much. 
and uh, and others in her coalition. And so I'm really excited to have her here. And they've been fighting against rad conversion for six years and have drowned it to a halt. And they've dealt with Greg Russ firsthand because he was before he was in New York, he was in Minneapolis. So without further ado, Laden, you are up. Can you can everyone hear me? Hi everyone. I have to I have a problem with my video, so I'm, I might have to stop the video while I'm giving my uh, talk just so it, it's just it, sometimes I get cut off. So I'm going to have to turn off my video, but then I can turn it back on when, uh, when we have questions. So just give me a second. Okay, so I, as Ryan said, um, my name is Ladan Yusuf, and I'm from the Defend Glendale and Public Housing Coalition. I am a public housing resident. I've been a resident of public housing since 20, 2004. And as many as just, uh, um, and so in Minneapolis, and we found out about our homes and the fact that MPHA, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, wanted to demolish our homes in 2014. So I've lived there for 10 years when I found out about it. And actually, I didn't even find out through just them telling me. It was through uh, the white neighbor, neighbors that lived around us that were hearing about it through their board meetings in their neighborhoods, where MPHA wanted to get their permission to see it was okay for, for them to, uh, to, uh, to demolish us without telling residents. So when I found out uh, through a long story, I went around and I door knocked and I found out that no one knew anything about it. And my background is in community organizing and, and leadership development. So I was just like, it was just a natural thing for me to get people together. And then we, we all knew that we were being duped after many, many meetings of us asking questions about what is going on and not being told the truth. So in 2015, we were able to stop RAD at, at Glendale and we thought that would be the end of it. But the reason why we stopped RAD is because MPHA was embarrassed and the city was embarrassed that, that people were coming out and this is, going to, this is turning out to be a racial thing and they paused it. They told us that they stopped it, but in reality, we found out that they paused it. And in 20, and so in all of 2016, we were fighting to get MPHA and the city of Minneapolis to pass an ordinance where they would not demolish Glendale. And in 2014 and 2015 is when we created our campaign, which is all resident led called Defend Glendale Public Housing Coalition. And we didn't trust the nonprofits in our, in, in our, in our city to, to help us, even though we went to them for help, they actually undermined us. And we made sure that our space was only resident led because that is the only way we're gonna be moving forward. And that was the key for us to actually even last this long. Um, because a lot of people were not were undermining us and there was a lot of folks that would come in with their white privilege think that they know everything and then they end up like making things worse for us so we just said we're all resident led we're going to be resident led and that's it and majority of our residents are uh, black uh, uh, black immigrant black and then asian uh, african american a uh, black immigrant from east africa and west africa and asian it might take me two more minutes ryan so just please forgive me uh so i have a lot to share but the reality is this is um, when will how long how long will these residents stay in these homes when they convert to rat? There's no guarantee. The plan is exactly what is happening now to get rid of residents slowly as they go as 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 time passes and to and to change the lease and to come up with new rules when these developers take over. To me, this is nothing but white supremacy. And affordable housing is not public housing. It isn't. Affordable housing is a term that these developers and these politicians use to try to convince you that they have your best interests at heart. It's not, and I can send some sites in there in, in the links later to talk about that. Now, as I said about the history of, 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 of our campaign, in 2017 is when Greg Russ came here. When he came here, he came from Cambridge, Massachusetts, actually, which is not, which is right next door to Boston. And he also privatized those homes. And he came here because we were, because I think they realized that the residents were organizing and they needed a big fish to silence us. He came here, he, man, he managed to manipulate the media. He, he managed to manipulate already racist city. As you all know, Minneapolis is very racist and, and basically turned everybody against us. And they were all ready to do that anyway. 
and he managed to try to manipulate everything. As a result, he brought in something called, he said that I'm not, I'm not only going to get rid of RAD in, in, in Glendale, I'm, I'm going to push RAD for Glendale, but I'm also going to push RAD in other, in other buildings. And that is when we started organizing and changing our name to Defend Glendale and Public Housing Coalition. And I wanted to talk about Section 18, actually, um, and talk about briefly right before I end this, uh, uh, before I end my piece. Um, at Elliot Twins, where Rad was converted, only two people were, Greg Rex picked two people to say, hey, you guys can write the letter as a resident council and move on with that. And then that's what they used to rent, to, to, um, to send the letter to HUD and to send the letter to the city to say the resident council approved it. The residents never approved that. We've been protesting it for two years. We started organizing together and we realized then that the residents were also being silenced, intimidated, which is very good at what Greg Russ does. And that's really very important to know. And they proposed a relocation plan, which was basically an eviction plan. And there was no guarantee that the rents were going to be 30% of income. That's also very important to know because the residents, most of the time, the residents are really, really concerned about the rents being increased and RAD is notorious for that. So as a result, with the controversy really building up in Minneapolis with RAD, he also brought in Section 18. Now, Section 18, and I wanted to kind of make corrections about it. Section 18 was, was a program that was used in the past for homes that were really too, too bad to be, I mean, it was such a bad shape that you can't really do anything with it. And you have to, the, 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 uh, uh, the housing authority has to show that they are really in need of money and they sell it or they dispose it and demolish it. That was the point of Section 18. And before Trump, you couldn't really get rid of section you couldn't really in, uh, impose section 18 this way it was only five percent of the total stock of a housing authority can you actually transform to section 18. Trump came in and they expanded and deregulated and also got rid of all the protections and they said you anybody who wants to use section 18 any housing authority can do that so he said Greg Russ said before he left well section 18 is here why can't we just go ahead head and and use section 18 and people were asking why do we need it well they say and he's and i was in a meeting where he said to us it because they're letting us do it and every time we we i talked to him personally because we were protesting him everywhere he was he said i am going to get rid of public housing oh yeah i see your time ryan just give me one more second and i'll be done um he said I, i'm going to get rid of public housing and 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 that is the that is his point that's why he came here when things got worse is when he went over to, to NYSHA and at the same time is what NYSHA was, uh, I guess, caused and handpicked him. So Section 18 can be reversed. It can be reversed to what it was before Carson and Trump came back, came uh, came in, and, and RAD can also be re regulated because Maxine Waters wrote about RAD and how RAD does not work and how RAD was supposed to be some sort of a pilot project that continued to expand. So we really need to understand that. So Section 18, the reason why they're using Section 18 right now is because there's there's all the all the protections and resident protections have been gutted. And that is why there's, it's so easy, easier than RAD right now. And that's something that they are, and Greg Russ is pushing that. Greg Russ, is, he's, he's everywhere. He's, he's, he's out in Boston, in Minneapolis, in New York City. He is the czar. We, we named him the czar of privatization and gentrification. So it's really important to remember that our residents who were, uh, who were converted in Minneapolis at 18 were 717 homes, and they're still trying to convert it. No money came in and nothing was re repaired. So the whole point about repairs being being something big that to try to sell it to the residents, that's not true. And I just want to make another thing important, another important point is that it's really important to organize and fight back. And we have to have the residents leading the fight because res residents are the ones who are in pain. We are the ones who are suffering from this. This. And we are the ones who cannot give up. It's our homes. They want to destroy our communities. This is not a, a, a money issue. This is about these developers have nothing else to eat up on, so they're going to public land. It's a land grab, okay? And it's really important to understand that. So I'm just, I'm standing with you guys. All of the residents that we organize with in Minneapolis are with you. We are in solidarity. We've got to make this a national uh, platform. We also have other, other residents in New York City that are doing the same thing. Shout out to uh, residents to, uh, um, it's Marquise, uh, Marquise's folks. Um, uh, it's called, um, 
residents, what is the name of the group? I forget the name of the group, but it's residents uh, to preserve public housing. They're also fighting that, they're fighting it. And I, 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 we've been working together. So it's really important that everybody organizes because this is about land grab. It's about gentrifying our neighborhoods. It's about getting rid of people's communities. It's about destroying black and brown black communities. It's, it's, it's also about getting rid of community wealth. That's what this is about. And Greg Russ is, is notorious. He has done this all over the, all over the city, all over in, in, in all over the nation in different cities. And it's not something he's going to stop. He's getting $400,000 a year to fly every weekend in Minneapolis. So he's got his hands here and he's got his hands everywhere. And he is pushing Section 18. And they go to him and people like him that they travel from place to place to do this. So that's the end of my piece. Um, I want to make sure I didn't forget anything else about Section 18. Oh, about Section 18. They didn't even go to the city vote here. They just went straight to, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, Lisa Bender and uh, Mayor Fry just wrote a letter to how to lobby it. And how to say, well, if your city wants it, there's nothing we can do. It's all voluntary program. Section 18 is a voluntary program. RAD is a voluntary program. This is not a need. This is what they want. There's not like we have to have this. This is something that they want to do. OK, because they see this as money. This is nothing else than that. So that's it's really it's really important to um, to know that I'll put in some links on there that we wrote. Uh, follow us on Defend Glendale and Public Housing Coalition. Uh, let's see. And I think that's about it. I'm I'm done for now, unless you all have any questions. Um, yeah. So there we go. We got to keep public housing public and we got to build more. So we got to keep that. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so well said. Yeah, it's really absurd, uh, this Section 18 stuff and what Greg Russ is doing. And it's really important, the, the experience you've shared here and, and with others before uh, has been so helpful for us. As Alonso mentioned in the chat, so much of what we learn has come from your website. Um, so now, next up is uh, Chantel, uh, a UFAD organizer in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, who's going to introduce the situation there. Let me just ask Chantel on mute. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much um, to everyone for sharing your experiences and uh, lessons in organizing. Um, this is really inspiring and really cool to hear from Laudan. You know, we've drawn a lot of inspiration from your struggle uh, at Glendale. Um, so yeah, I'm Chantel. I'm in the United Front Against Displacement in the Bay Area. Um, I've actually been able to meet some residents and organizers in New York and Boston recently and uh, went to the first Harlem River Houses protest, so it's really exciting to see you all here. Sorry. Um, I think it's really uh, crucial that we're organizing against um, privatization of public housing on a national level, um, because this is part of a federal plan to eliminate public housing, so uh, to oppose it, we have to be organized nationally, too. Uh, so in the Bay, we're organizing with tenants in public housing in Oakland and San Francisco. In both cities, almost all the public housing has been privatized in recent decades via HOPE 6 and RAD. Uh, in San Francisco, there's a citywide privatization plan that's similar to RAD and Blueprint for Change um, called HOPE SF. So the city government, um, banks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, corporations like Google, Kaiser Permanente, foundations, they're all working together by HOPE SF to eliminate the last public housing in San Francisco, um, which is in working class neighborhoods in the city. Um, they're destroying them and building these mixed income developments owned and managed by different private developers. Um, so there's only two remaining public housing developments that are still under the San Francisco Housing Authority called Sunnydale and Petrero. Both are a few years into being demolished um, over the next decade. Um, some residents at Sunnydale and Petrero have been displaced and their homes destroyed and uh, the new developments are being built currently. Um, so at Sunnydale, there's 775 units that are townhouses. Um, Hope SF is planning to replace all the townhouses with this um, mixed income, mixed use development, forcing residents out of their townhouses and into multi-story buildings. Um, so residents at Sunnydale have been organizing to resist uh, the privatization and destruction of their homes, to not be bullied into signing leases with a private management company, uh, Mercy Housing, uh, to speak up about the truth that these private developers are just gonna make the situation worse, uh, like we've heard about tonight. Um, the two developers at Sunnydale, Mercy, and Related California are working together with the Housing Authority to manipulate residents into thinking that this is a good thing. Um, they've been threatening that if residents organize to uh, oppose the demolition and privatization of their homes, that they won't even get a spot in the new buildings. 
the San Francisco Housing Authority sent um, the United Front Against Displacement a letter last month saying they were aware of our organizing and tried to smear our efforts by saying that we were harassing residents. Uh, so we see that they're scared that residents are actually talking to each other uh, about what's going on and getting organized. So they're uh, trying to discourage people from organizing, but it hasn't worked. Uh, residents at Sunnydale um, have been organizing for months. They put together a petition opposing the privatization with over 100 signatures. Uh, they've organized multiple protests and are starting to organize with residents at Potrero and privatized developments. Uh, in Oakland, tenants have been organizing at Cypress Village in West Oakland and more recently uh, in Lockwood Gardens in East Oakland. So these are the last two um, public housing developments in Oakland. They're not currently facing privatization, but residents have been organizing to form independent tenant unions to fight for their interests uh, so that they are organized when the Oakland Housing Authority does try to privatize them. Um, they're forming independent tenant unions because we've seen at many public and privatized developments like we've heard tonight that the tenant association there does not represent residents. Uh, residents at Cyprus have been organizing since the fall. Um, they have a petition with over 100 signatures to stop OHA's favoritism, to demand proper maintenance um, because the housing authority has been intentionally neglecting uh, the buildings and letting them fall into disrepair and to stop harassing residents with these three-day notices to quit uh, over nothing, which uh, Melda will be speaking more about. So in the Bay, we've been organizing uh, and coordinating more between cities, like between San Francisco and Oakland, because we've really seen the importance of working together more broadly. Um, so residents from San Francisco and Oakland are going to the other cities um, to talk to each other and to speak at protests. Um, and also more recently, residents of public housing um, have been organizing with residents of privatized developments. Um, so I guess um, my last thing to say is I feel like we've really seen in organizing that the only change uh, that's gonna come is gonna come from the people, from the residents coming together. Uh, like other people have talked about tonight, uh, you know, the mayor, um, other politicians on like the city, state and federal level, the developers and nonprofits are all working together. Um, they're not looking out for residents. So I think it's really important that we continue this fight by working together across the country, uh, like we are tonight. Um, because, you know, housing authorities, the government, um, they're working to make us feel isolated. Um, but there's so many more of us than there are of them. And there's a lot that we can do together. So I'm really excited uh, to hear from Soa, who's a resident of Sunnydale, to talk about organizing there. Thank you so much, Chantel. Now I will unmute Soa. Give me one second. Hey, everybody, just ignore the man behind the camera right now. Hi, everyone. My name is Soa. I'm a resident here in Sunnydale. I've lived here for 16 years, and I, I haven't had any problems in my home. I love living here. It's like a haven for me. I've been in this city since I was six years old, moved here from Hawaii, 1967. And I grew up in housing. I grew up in public housing, majority of my life. And I also raised all my children here. And my children are now grown and they're on their own. But the thing about it is my concern is that they're trying to move us out of our, our home, our haven which we are happy with where we're living at. And they built two big buildings, which hold 176 units in there. And they say, oh, it's gonna be very nice and it's gonna be all dandy. But we have not been in there yet, but we have been in other uh, projects that have been demolished already and been built by co uh, private contractors. And we spoke to the tenants out there and they are not happy where they're at. A lot of things in their units are not being met by, by the management there. And I can say is that they're quick to collect their rent. And if they're behind their rent, they have to pay $25 percentage of the late fee. Now, as, as I know, of, I've lived here, I never had to pay for late fee. I've always paid my, my monthly rent on time, but not a fee. So they're going to privatize all this for us 
and tell us that, oh, it's going to be really good for us. No, the places are going to come with rules. There's no breathing space in there for us. A lot of tenants here are a lot of senior citizens and a lot of children, and they're afraid to move in there. And they also have children that they have to take care of. So we want to fight this. We want to protest against these people trying to make money off of the poor, off of the senior citizens, off of the people who are just trying to struggle to get through. Mind you, we just got through with the coronavirus over the year. I've lost a lot of family members. I don't need to be going through this. So this is my testimony of sharing about what we're facing right now, which we do not want to face that death trap that they're trying to set us in. And that's that's my story. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Soa. And you know, one thing that I realized didn't get mentioned earlier, but the rules are a big thing. At Lenox, they imposed 50 new rules after privatizing, including rules like children are not allowed to play outside. This Lennox has two courtyards. They cut down all the trees just to make the point. They had said you can't install air conditioning. You can't put anything up on the walls because that could raise the fire insurance. So as people who have been through privatization know, it comes with a whole bunch of new rules and regulations designed to make you feel like a prisoner in your own home. So next up is Melda from Cyprus uh, in Oakland. All right, let me just unmute Melda. Give me one second. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. hi. <laughs> All right. Um, Colleen, first say who you are. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm Colleen. I'm with the United Front Against Displacement. Yeah. And uh, so yeah. one, one night, she and a couple of the other guys knocked on my door. So as soon as she told me that she was uh, knocking on the doors for tenants rights, I pulled them in. Oh, come in here right now. Because I had a, a few issues. But it's not half as bad as all these stories I'm hearing. Oh my God. Okay, but anyway, my thing was the garbage dump and the rats. The garbage dump area, mine, had got so bad till the guys that pick up the garbage wouldn't pick up the garbage because they had so much garbage around. Oh, they, you know, and the rats, big old beautiful rats. I started giving them names. You know, I'm like, oh, hell no. So, uh, that issue after Colleen and, 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 and the organization started and your neighbors. And, and got together, signed a petition, mm -hmm. and they sent a few letters to the office. After a few weeks, or maybe in a few months, the dumpster area. Now they're starting to power wash it. They cut maintenance, come and put the garbage back in the dumpster. What? So that why is it so hard about that? You know? So that was my thing. So now we're working on other things. Since I've been going to these meetings, I walk out of there depressed. I knew people had it bad. Colleen's been showing me pictures of the inside of these people's apartments. And those are the people that should be at these meetings. Yeah, for, for the, the black mold. As, as I showed my daughter, I have a 30-year-old daughter and a 29-year-old son, pictures of the inside of these people's homes. and. Typical young kid. Oh, they choose to live like that. Mm. What? That's the way young people think. What? They choose? Yeah. So I just stay pissed all the time. But the one good thing is since the, the uh, I have seen a difference as far as my dumpster area and they're power washing the other and no rats. They took down the bushes. Mm -hmm. They could have did that a long time ago. They took down the book, so I haven't seen the rat in a, in a while. I haven't seen a rat in a while. <laughs> so it's a lot of other things that's going to take a lot of time for us to finish. And I think like, you know, Anthony was talking about, you know, like, what is this game? And uh, it's like miscommunication. And, and uh, a lot of folks were talking about three-day notice to quits in New York. That happens here. And yeah. And then it's this favoritism, right? You have Melda or I think Vanessa at one point was, or Soa who say that they, you know, they really love this place. And, and you know, Brenda started talking about, well, it's a blessing and a curse in disguise. And, and it sort of comes up when Melda's uh, 
daughter sees a neighbor who lives two doors up with mold and says, the well, they, cho they choose to live there. And, and we know that mm. that's not what's happening um, because everybody's outlining how um, we know that. So they tell people to call and then they don't show up. And then they also tell us that they're pulling their funding and their money. And we know that workers don't show up. So you're continuing to give residents numbers to call. You do a shoddy job with painting over mold. Um, and maintenance two and they, years for transport. And they choose. Years. They have a list. They don't go and order up. Yeah. They choose which ones they're going to. I had a broken window. I couldn't close my bedroom window. That's dangerous. It took them six weeks. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. I couldn't close my bedroom window. But so they go. In, they don't go in order up. Mm -hmm. They choose. Okay. So. <laughs> So yeah, uh, mm -hmm. so, so I think, um, you know, what do we do and, uh, you know, continuing to expose that we're not complaining, residents aren't complaining, they're simply stating what actually is happening and, and residents follow protocol and then OHA or housing authorities, not just OHA, uh, they don't follow through with the plan that they tell residents they should be doing to fix these problems. So it's time to make our own plan and I think that's what we heard a lot, especially from uh, Brenda right at the beginning, that we need to keep fighting, you know, and, and that this relationship, even if it's a private developer, um, it's still going to continue. So, so what's really the issue, right? Uh, seems like we know that we're being lied to a bit. And, uh, oh, yeah, a bit? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. anything else? I think we're good. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you both so much. So we're coming to the end now. Uh, Kristen's going to put, uh, I believe, uh, a survey up on on the um, on the screen, so people can check that out. That's going to have a link that you can go to to get involved, fill it out if you want to get involved. I'm going to share a little link from uh, the United Front Against Displacement's website. That's a, for one of our publications called Urban Core. That's created by residents at Grant Manor and Lennox, as well as some of the organizers. Uh, and if people are interested in that, we'll be glad to have you uh, submit and be in touch. You know, the big thing, as I see it coming out of this is there's a lot of powerful interests that are lining up, as, as uh, Laden put it, it's a land grab on a big scale. You know, they've got luxury condos going up all over the cities. They've got new developments coming in and public housing is on prime real estate. These powerful interests in the government, in the banks, these developers, they stand to make hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars off of stealing people's homes. You know, if you look at it, going back to the mass incarceration, before mass incarceration started, there were 4 million people across the country in public housing. Now there's 2 million. And in that same time period, 1 million more people got put in jail. So there's a real correlation there with the homelessness crisis going on with so many issues. And it can seem intimidating. You know, people have shared a lot of stories today, including some people who shared stories anonymously because of the harassment they faced, because of the intimidation and fears of retaliation. But the truth is, again, you are not alone. There are residents all across the country coming together. There are probably residents right next door to you or a couple doors down who would want to come together. And all it takes is a few people getting a petition together, as Melda was just saying, getting together to have a meeting to talk about what's going on and how folks can come together. And that's really how things get rolling. And once that snowball starts rolling down the hill, momentum starts to build. You know, from a few residents, for example, in Harlem River coming together, they just had a rally, probably 100 people there on, uh, on this past Saturday to start the rent strike. I was down from Boston visiting Harlem, and I saw that, and I was so inspired. And it wasn't just residents from Harlem River. You had people from all across New York City coming out to support them from other developments in the area. So from other projects in the area, public housing. And so the way I see it, you know, the people, even if we're facing against powerful interests, Greg Russ, Bank of America, you know, Trump era changes to the regulation, the Obama era program with RAD, all of that, you know, we can come together and we can fight back and we can win. And especially the stuff that Laden and others have been doing in Minneapolis shows that, you know, they have ground this to a halt for six years and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. And so we can learn from each other and continue to share experiences to work together. And with that, our power and our organizations and our abilities to fight back and to make changes for the better will only grow. So if you're feeling hopeless or you're feeling down, you know, they try to wear you down day in and day out, but don't let them grind them down. Remind, remind yourself that your neighbors, people down the block, people across the country have your back. 
And I'd encourage all of you to fill out that form, to be in touch, and let's find ways to work together because we can stop the, the issues with privatization. We can grind privatization to a halt nationally and we can reverse the trend and get all these needed repairs. Because as it was just said, you know, the housing authorities have a plan to neglect the buildings until there's no, they say there's no choice but privatization. But we know there's choices, there's options. We don't have to play by the rules they're setting. We can come together and organize and fight for the change that residents really need, not the change that benefits the banks and the wealthy. So thank you all. I'm gonna put an email address in the chat too. Uh, if people wanna stay in touch. And please, anyone who's part of an organization of one form or another, whether it be just a resident organization or a broader organization, whatever it is, uh, like I mean, organization, one building or broader organization, share it in the chat, share your info, be in touch, and, and let's work together. Yeah, thanks to everybody for coming. I think that's a wrap for us on the night, right? That's it. So uh, yeah, please fill out the forms and um, get in touch and we'll go from there. And thanks to all the speakers you, who share their stories and their experiences today. Um, so powerful. I feel like, you know, I always feel like we're on the precipice of like really building up um, this large national movement. And I feel that more tonight than I have, you know, ever. So thanks to everybody.